Hey everybody, it's Jessica DeMassa with What's the Future Health. I am talking to the who's who of health tech and healthcare innovation. And today we are going down deep into the microbiome. So I have a gut feeling that this is gonna be a great conversation. So please welcome the president and chief commercial officer of day two, Josh Stevens. Josh, how are you? Well, it's good to see you, good to be here. I love this. So you guys have just closed a Series B funding round, 37 million, brings your total up to 85. Couple investors in there, A Moon and Cathay Innovations led. So, I mean, tell us what you guys do, because my understanding is you guys have built the world's largest micro gut microbiome database, data set. Right. You're microbiome testing people, and then you're providing nutrition recommendations to help them specifically with like diabetes, prediabetes to keep their blood sugar stable. But give us the detail behind this. Sure. So uh, day two is the largest microbiome uh, database in the world now associated with clinical factors. So uh, from a research perspective, we know more about the gut than anyone else uh, and how it relates to gender, age, disease. The first application on that data set is a glycemic control application for metabolic disease, and that's what's in the market now. The database and data set offers us a mining opportunity for pipeline of other applications around microbiome for uh, other chronic conditions, potentially GI, and potentially uh, even oncology. Okay. Glycemic control metabolic disease. Talk to me a little bit more about that for those who may not be familiar with what those two things really mean. Fair enough. So uh, the, the best way to think about it is the number one way to measure the success of food or nutritional intake is on how your body processes the food into energy. And the way we measure that is, uh, is through glucose. And so a glucose range that is healthy is typically in the 80 to 140 zone for a healthy person. Below 80 uh, results in a hangry um, feeling and overeating. And over 140 typically results in that bloated feeling and, um, and can then really lead to a, what's called a spike and then a crash where you then get hungry an hour later. And so the name of the game they used to say in the eighties uh, under the Atkins diet was to stay in the zone because this glucose zone of 80 to 140 has been well known for a long time, but how to do it in a healthy way has been very tricky. And we think we've now figured that out with our microbiome profile. Okay, so say a little bit more about that because my, my understanding is that, like you've said, you've had this, you have this large data set of microbiome data. You're focused on this specific piece right now, first, um, first application of that, of that technology to this data set. And my understanding is that you guys are in market in the, the diabetes space. So how does that work? So when the research that led to the company being created was uh, published almost uh, six years ago, um, the, we had a model that would allow us to predict uh, glucose response for any food that you'd eat. Okay. This was considered um, uh, groundbreaking uh, because typically, um, well, there were three things that we found. Number one, that people respond differently to the same food. That was believed to be true by some people, but not empirically proven. That was proven by the research. Okay. The second thing we proved was that people respond differently, not only to individual foods, but to food combinations. And so meals affect people differently. The same meal affects two people, even husband and wife or father and daughter very differently. And then the third thing we learned was that we could predict this response to food if we had a gut microbiome profile in advance. And so this led to a, uh, a shift in how we could then approach treating metabolic disease. Instead of uh, the, the legacy way of doing things is you get a lancet and you pierce your finger if you have diabetes, you get a glucose reading. And if you're high, you, you, uh, you deal with uh, insulin or medication. And if you're low, you eat something. Now we don't have to deal with that nonsense of trial and error after a meal and lancets. The end era of lancets can be over. Now we can just get profiled uh, from our gut profile and then know before we eat by checking on our phone, uh, looking up any food or food combination or menu item at a restaurant or prepackaged item with a barcode. Um, here's how this food will work for me. And we use a, a 10 point scale. So over seven is great and below seven is a spiking meal typically. Okay, so let me understand this. So, so the the folks that are using day two right now, it may, I've heard seventy thousand plus patient members that you guys have, have using this. So they would, um, in theory, they would get their gut microbiomes 
scanned or tested or whatever. And then you're able to use the app to kind of figure out what, how they're going to respond proactively to a food before they eat it. That's right. So the solution right. really has three parts to it. Uh, mm -hmm. Number one, it's the, the lab process, which you think about, if you've ever heard of Cologuard, it's, yeah. uh, I think it is Cologuard for metabolic disease or Cologuard for diabetes. Um, you have to provide your sample, put it in your mailbox, goes back to the lab. When the results come in, uh, a clinician, typically a registered dietitian or a diabetes educator will work with you through telehealth to say, here's your results. Let's interpret those results and let's understand what you're eating now so we can demonstrate what foods you're eating today that work for your body and what foods you're eating today that you thought were good that maybe aren't so great. And then how can we uh, tune those foods? Because what the big revolutionary uh, impact of the solution is, it's not about saying no to food. It's about finding out what doesn't work for your body, what scores poorly from a glucose profile, and then finding a combination or adjusting the dosage of ingredients to make that meal work for you. So you can continue to eat the things you love and have a regular life instead of having this um, diet of no or a category elimination of carbohydrates, which we think is uh, the stone age when it comes to um, uh, precision nutrition and precision medicine. This sounds like so magical because like you just said, I mean, it, it almost seems like, like any type of diet, it's a diet of no. And so what I'm hearing you say though, is it's like, there might be some foods that are a no because of, but there's like a reason for it. It's not just like categorically for everybody. This is terrible. Stop eating it. And then on the other, the other part of it was you said there's, there's combinations. So it, it's like people can mix things up and maybe make bad foods good again. Right. Sure. So let me give you a couple examples from my own experience. Yeah, I would like to hear that, actually. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a patient as well as the, the president. And the, um, the, for me, sushi is a regular go-to dinner. And many people in nutrition and, uh, and uh, metabolic disease would say, oh, rice, that's a, that's a no-no. It's any white or brown food, stay away from it. As it turns out, the rice is not the problem for me with sushi. It's ginger. The really? ginger actually in combination with the sushi meal causes me to have a spiking meal. By eliminating the ginger or at least reducing it significantly, I can still have the sushi that I love. I just am not going so big on the ginger. That's a very tiny change to keep a food and meal that I love in my, uh, in my you know, regular um, diet of eating. And so this is a good example. Another one is um, Greek salad. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I have a Greek descent and I have a lot of uh, Mediterranean food in my diet eat a lot of Greek salad and I will eat a lot of Greek salad. And so a pound of Greek salad is too much, not only from a dosage perspective, but it provides too much glucose. I can spike on too many cucumbers in a salad. But if I actually reduce the dose and have more like a quarter pound of salad, no problem. So it's not about eliminating the meal, even though it might spike me as I was having it, it's about moderating the dosage in this case. So again, not about saying no, but saying yes, and here's how much, or yes, and here's how to combine. And it's cool that there's like this little roadmap that's guiding you through this. So you're not just like trial and error in this. Well, I want to know, um, tell me, I, I was going to ask you about outcomes because I mean, I understand and we'll come back to the fact, you know, how you guys are going to market. You're selling through large, you're selling through employers um, to reach people that way, particularly with the diabetes, pre-diabetes, obesity side of your business. But I want to hear about some of the outcomes that you guys have been able to show. So tell us like how, how is this helping people lose weight? How is it helping them keep their blood sugar in range? I mean, I want to hear some numbers. Sure. So when we go to uh, large self-insured employers or to payers, um, we will typically approach with a, uh, a fee for outcome model. We believe that we should get paid when we deliver outcomes. We believe that's the way of the future in healthcare. And we want to uh, be aligned with that approach in terms of an outcomes-based pricing solution. At risk, so, so hot right now. <laughs> yep. so because the science is uh, legit and because the protocol works, we're willing to go at risk. And that makes a huge difference as we go to market in terms of not only getting acceptance and uh, adoption, but also distribution with the payers. And so uh, the, the things that we follow from a clinical perspective, the primary measure is A1C. A1C comes down when on program. We'll typically see a point of A1C, often much more. Um, it really depends where you start. If we get a patient with an A1C of 12, they could come down four points. If we get someone with an A1C of seven, they're going to come down probably a point and they're going to get controlled. And our endpoint in all cases is remission. We believe that we can get people from an uncontrolled glucose state to a controlled glucose state over a period of months and quarters and ultimately off of meds. And that's really the big win for us. 
In addition to A1C, we look at time in range, which is the measurement that comes off of a glucose monitor that we put on someone's arm, or they put it on themselves. We guide them through the telehealth to do that. And then we also look at weight. Uh, weight is a secondary outcome. We purposely don't lead with it because when it, you have a weight loss program, that tends to lead to other kinds of, we think, unnatural acts and unnatural behavior about crash dieting. And so the goal is to not have a crash diet. The goal is not to have radical change, but rather to have small, tiny changes with every meal to bring the foods that you love into control. And as you do that, and as every meal is in that range of 80 to 140, weight starts to melt off and we, that would be a slow melt. So, you know, if it's a pound a week or if it's a pound every two weeks, that's great. And we just track that. And over the course of three months, it's, we see typically a good 10 pounds. At six months, we'll see more. At nine months, we'll see more. And then it will plateau at about a year. But the most important part is it's not a yo-yoing effect of lose and then gain it back or gain more back. It's a slow melt that is a result of a side effect of glycemic control. When you have meals that fit your body, you don't add excess weight. The excess glucose can't be stored as fat. You just consume what you need. I love that. And I think, I mean, I, I feel like there are a lot of um, alternatives that are out there. I mean, this diabetes management, pre-diabetes, you know, diabetes prevention space is so crowded, particularly with employers. And I mean, you think you've alluded to um, couple companies in your answer there about what they're doing, you know, like whether it's like Virta who's categorically eliminating carbs and, and, and asking everybody to eat a keto diet and they've had great success. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask about is that word remission that you just landed in there, which is one of the things that they talk about. So tell me, I guess, how you guys are different in terms of the way that you're helping people achieve re remission. Are your numbers just as good? Because that's, I mean, one of the big claims from, from Virta is that they're, you know, very much focused on remission for diabetes. And then you know, that, and there is science behind that. They've got numbers behind that. I'd like to hear what you've got. And then also, you know, maybe say something too about, you know, about the word remission with diabetes, because I feel like that's always a word that whenever it's associated with diabetes in particular, people kind of bristle a little bit. So sit, talk to me a little bit about this aspect of what you've got going on over there at day two. Sure. So I would say uh, two things. One, the, the two words that we see used in the marketplace are reversal and remission. As a matter of principle, we will not stand with reversal. We think that's not a, an accurate term. And the, the ADA, the American Diabetes Association would agree with that, which is why we are aligning with them on an approach to remission, which is generally uh, accepted now uh, from ADA and from uh, the AMA as a year in control and a year without medication. So the, the idea of uh, going to, uh, of mortality with medications and never getting out of diabetes, we think is ending. The opportunity to get out of diabetes and really be in remission, because you can always go back, it's a behavioral disease, um, is possible. We, uh, we would say that the Verda approach of keto is admirable and that for those people who can do keto, we think that's great. We also know that there's the negative side effects on cholesterol, uh, kidney and liver from keto. And so we think there's a better way, and that is not to be carb elimination, but rather to have the foods that fit your body by having the gut profile. And so we can get substantially the same or better outcomes that we're seeing from Verda in terms of uh, A1C reduction, time and range, weight loss, and ability to attain remission or control. We'll just call it well-controlled patient, um, but doing it in a much more sustainable and broad reach way because Again, the people that we see in the market who can do, who can adhere to a keto diet, it's hard. It's hard to go without carbs for the rest of your life. But if you could say, you know what, that's, there's a better way. And that is how do you find the carbs that fit your body and what works for your body and what works for your uh, spouse's body and your children's body, they're all gonna be different. And the only way we know that is not just to look at food, but to look at the person eating the food. And by doing those two things together, we can have a much better, much more precision approach uh, and personalized approach to nutrition and medicine. I understand you have a really interesting story about where your science came from, like where this is based on, because like, it does sound like, like how did, how, does, how has nobody heard of this before? But like this science has been around for a long time. So say a little bit about that. Sure. So 10 years ago, uh, two professors in Israel, uh, Aran Siegel and Aran Elanov, uh, had a hypothesis uh, that there might not be a best diet for humans. 
that the idea no food pyramid what <laughs> one size fits uh, all one size fits most maybe not uh, and because it had that been uh, legit perhaps we wouldn't have the trends that we have in metabolic disease around the globe and so they embarked on a novel study, the largest nutrition study ever conducted, looking at a thousand people and collecting every clinical measure that they could possibly collect to discern how did people respond to food? Did people respond to food the same way or did people respond to food differently? And did people respond to food in combinations the same or differently? And by collecting all this data using uh, classical machine learning techniques, could we build a model that would say for the next patient, could we predict their outcomes if we had some of the same inputs? And that's exactly what happened. They confirmed that people respond differently to the same food. They confirmed that combinations respond differently and they confirmed they could predict it primarily using the signal of the gut microbiome and some baseline clinical measures like starting A1C. And so with this, now we have a, a breakthrough, non-invasive approach to diabetes, a food as medicine approach to diabetes and impacts that are better than the standard of care and certainly rival or better than keto from an adherence perspective. All of this was published in the journal Cell about six years ago. And that was considered a, uh, a landmark paper, uh, once in a generation work that change, could change the field of endocrinology and metabolic disease. And so day two was created uh, through a tech transfer, licensing the IP from that paper from the Weizmann, and that became the beginnings of the company in Israel. Okay, now, I, okay. Now, from that licensed IP to where we are now, fast forward, we are building, you know, uh, uh, building into the database that you that you you labeled as the world's largest. Tell me what's next for that, because I mean, like we, we've said all along here. I mean, this this whole um, the application for diabetes, for pre-diabetes, obesity, and these metabolic disorders is the first. So, what's ahead for it? So, I think the the first part was to get the science into the field into practice. And now that we're doing that with 70,000 patients, uh, payers, providers, employers are seeing the impact and picking this up and adopting it as a set of tools they can use either as clinicians or as customers where we provide the clinical support. Uh, so that's been the first translation of the science into the market. Now it's about scaling that out through payers and through jumbo employers um, who are looking for a better mousetrap after uh, a couple decades of so-so results. I, I think you're right, Jessica, the diabetes management space has been crowded. At the same time, I don't think it's very crowded with solutions that have meaningful impact and great adherence and are easy and understandable for people to use. And so what makes this different and special is uh, it's easy. Uh, people can, everyone can do this. Everyone can benefit from glycemic control. And it's about matching food to an individual's body, not about giving generic recommendations out of a book. Um, or having a category elimination of no more carbs for the rest of your life. And that's a, a game changer for, for the category, which we think is why we're now speaking to you, going to market and scaling up because the, the customers we're speaking with, primarily on the, uh, the payer and the employer side, see this as vastly different than what they've seen before. Yeah, I think like at Lancet Free, uh, diabetes management is uh, pretty appealing, right? <laughs> There's a lot of expense there. Um, what's next for the company? Like we just said at the very top, you guys just closed the series, B round. So, I mean, where, what does the next 18, and 18 months or two years look like for you guys? I'd say it's two tracks. I think one is it's now scaling the metabolic uh, disease uh, business that we have uh, through the payers in the US. I think that's gonna be job one. Uh, now that we have traction and acceptance, now it's just, you know, having, how do we get that everywhere it needs to be? I think that's track one. Track two is how do we develop and cultivate our research pipeline on this database? So if metabolic disease is job one, how do we look at other diagnostics and other uh, potential therapies, and other uh, pharmaceutical opportunities for drug development, uh, other opportunities for precision? Interestingly, we are seeing signals in the data um, that can reveal diagnosis before patients know. We are seeing uh, that there's commonality, for example, in folks with obesity, and we can find that signature in the microbiome without the patient telling us that. We believe there's similar signal for fatty liver. There's other signals we um, are likely now to uh, develop around uh, IBS, IBD, Crohn's, colitis, and the, the whole GI uh, category. And then ultimately, we think, uh, as I mentioned before, oncology is yet a third track that could be developed over time. And so the 
the gut is a very data rich area in terms of both cells that are shed and pass through, but also the bacteria profile of the gut and how it metabolizes what you eat and how it affects your body and also how it affects your mental health. And we know the gut brain axis is a meaningful uh, uh, connection that's getting, we're in inning one of discovering that. And by having our research team now take full advantage of the data that we have uh, to really bring other applications to market, we think that's where the the potential is, is in a product pipeline around, around all these ca categories and diseases. Awesome. That sounds really, that, that is so fascinating to me, especially that, that gut brain connection. I think that there, whatever work comes out of that, I'd be excited to see. In the meantime, I like this down with the glucometer uh, talk track. I feel like <laughs> I'm going to put that in your mouth. <laughs> the era of Lancets is over. I love it. I love it. You heard it here first, people. All right, Josh. Thank you so much for dropping by. It's been a pleasure to chat with you. I think this is so exciting. I love microbiome and I'm always excited to see some of these more um, unique uh, technologies being implemented and put into healthcare. So thank you so much for sharing what you guys are doing over there at day two. I really appreciate you coming by. It's a pleasure. Great to speak with you. Take care. All right, folks. That's Josh Stevens. He's the president and chief commercial officer over there at day two. Down with Lancet. The, the Lancet free era. What is it, Josh? Lancet free era of diabetes care. Is the era of Lancets is over. There you go. You heard it here. I'm Jessica DeMassa. Thank you so much for joining us. If you'd like to catch more interviews with those who are changing the way that we do healthcare, please check out my YouTube channel over there at youtube.com slash WTF Health. We'll talk to you guys real soon. Thanks again, Josh. See you. Thanks. Bye.